move. Okay, Matthew 21, starting in verse 12. Matthew 21, 12, a new day in God's house. The Bible says Jesus entered the temple of God and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priest and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus. Have you never read from the lips of children and infants you have called forth powerful praise? And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany where he spent the night. Early in the morning as Jesus was on his way back to the city, he was hungry. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went up to it but found nothing on it except leaves. Then he said to it, may you never bear fruit again. Immediately the tree withered. When the disciples saw this, they were amazed. How did the fig tree weather, wither so quickly, they asked. Jesus replied, truly I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to this fig tree, but you can also say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. How many of you know that's a good promise for us this morning? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people you love so much and your presence with us. I pray, Father, we would encounter you through the ministry of your word this morning. If your heart agrees, would you say amen and amen. So if you had only one week left to live, how would you spend it? What would you do? Where would you go? Who would you be sure to see? What, what matters would you try to settle with people? What things would you try to put right? What, what final words would you say to those that you love? Who would you try to lead to Christ? What, what final prayers would you lift up to God before you slipped into eternity and saw his face? During this season of Lent, we're, talking, we're walking with Jesus through the consecutive days of the Passion Week. It would be perfectly right to say that Jesus' life was the most important life ever lived. Now, all life is precious to God, and he is no respecter of persons, but all life comes from Jesus. And eternal life depends entirely upon Jesus. Our destinies hang entirely on the success of his earthly ministry. His was the most important life ever lived, and the last week, the Passion Week, was the most important week of his life. One of the ways the Bible communicates what's important is the amount of space that is devoted to a particular event. There is more written in the Gospels about the Passion Week than any other week of Jesus' life of 33 years. 30% of the Gospel of Matthew is dedicated to the Passion Week. 40% of Mark, 20% of Luke, 30% of John. So during this season of Lent, we are studying the most important week of the most important life ever lived. And it's full of lessons for us. You see, how Jesus spent his last week shows us how we ought to spend every week until we go to meet him face to face. Jesus shows us what we ought to prioritize. He shows us what we should focus our time and energies on and what we should just leave in God's hands. He shows us how we ought to relate to the people in our lives, our friends, our enemies, and even our frenemies. Last week, Pastor Nick shared with us about the first day of Passion Week, Palm Sunday. I want to tell you, I know the weather was kind of crummy last week. We were in Canada last week. I promise you it was crummier there than it was here. But if you missed Pastor Nick's sermon, do go online and listen to it or go on to our YouTube channel. I want to guarantee you it is the best sermon you will ever hear on Palm Sunday. 
Jesus spent Palm Sunday determined to complete the earthly mission that God gave him. And as we think about the days that God has allotted to us, as we we think about the number of days that might remain, we need to do the same. God has created us for a divine purpose to glorify him through our lives. Before we even knew him, before we even had our relationship with him restored through Christ, God prepared assignments specifically for us to complete, Paul says. People to reach and help an impact for salvation. So today let's talk about Holy Monday. How did Jesus spend his fifth to last day? He spent it investing in God's house. Early in the morning, Jesus again set out from the suburb of Bethany to the city of Jerusalem. Bethany was on the far side of the Mount of Olives, about a mile and a half outside of Jerusalem. It was mountainous, so probably took about an hour to walk from Bethany to Jerusalem. Along the way, Jesus passed through a village called Bethpage, which means house of early figs. That's significant. Standing by the road, Jesus saw a lone fig tree that was fully leafed out was a little bit surprising because it was a bit early. But there was no fruit on the tree in spite of the leaves, so Jesus cursed the tree and it withered. Then he went into the temple and he raised quite a ruckus. He began to drive out the people exchanging money and selling sacrificial animals. Afterwards, Jesus healed some blind and deaf people who came to him when they heard he was there. Some children began to praise Jesus as the Messiah, Hosanna to the son of David, and the Jewish leaders were outraged. They told Jesus, tell them to stop, and Jesus exchanged words with them. The last thing that happens on Holy Monday, John tells us, is that some Greek pilgrims asked to see Jesus. After Jesus speaks to them, he returns to Bethany again for the evening. So what was the purpose of Holy Monday? If you had only five days left to live, would you spend the day cursing fig trees and turning over tables? That's not exactly on my bucket list. But the events of this entire day are are intricately connected to one another. Through them, Jesus is announcing a new day in God's house. He's using his God-given authority to set things right. Beloved, I want to tell you, if ever there was a day, if ever there was a time when a new day is needed in God's house, it's right now. I don't know about you, but my heart broke this last week, watching the testimony of the students from the Parkland High School, the testimony of the parents whose children were lost. Something in our country is badly broken. And it is beyond the ability of our government to fix it. But we have the answer. Jesus is the answer. There is power in the gospel to heal our nation. But the church is asleep. Much like the temple in Jesus' day, there is so much potential power in the church But there is too little fruit. It's time to initiate a new day in God's house. One of the things that God has put in my heart for our move into the new sanctuary is to amend our name just a little bit. Not officially, but unofficially. When we move into the new sanctuary, we're going to welcome people to the new Harvest Time Church. But what God has put in my spirit is so much bigger than a new building. I believe that God wants to initiate here among us a new season of spiritual vitality. A new season of fruitfulness. A new season of supernatural activity. Of divine encounters. Of answered prayer. A new season of glorifying God. 
Looking at Holy Monday, I see three ways that we can follow Jesus initiating a new day in God's house. And I want to share about it quickly. Three ways we can follow Jesus initiating a new house. First of all, to initiate a a new day in God's house, we must embrace Jesus' authority. We must embrace Jesus' authority. Holy Monday has probably two of the most difficult episodes in Jesus' entire life, the cursing of the fig tree and the cleansing of the temple. Both of them really seem out of character for Jesus. What happened to the guy who said, take my yoke and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart? Where did that guy go? We must never forget that the Lamb of God is also the Lion of Judah. And meekness isn't weakness either. Meekness is strength under control. Meekness is strong enough not to defend oneself when being offended, but it's also strong enough to defend others when they are being offended. We will never understand Holy Monday unless we understand that the cursing of the fig tree and the cleansing of the temple are both prophetic acts and they are intricately connected to one another. The cursing of the fig tree and the cleansing of the temple both have the same meaning. Jesus is taking authority over his people and his house and he is declaring a new day. In the Bible and in the life of the church, there are both prophetic words and prophetic acts. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, God will move someone to deliver a prophecy by acting it out. Has anybody ever seen a prophetic act? Anybody ever seen? Let me see your hand. Have you ever seen a prophetic act? Usually the actions are are dramatic to make an impression. In the Old Testament, God had Isaiah walk around in his boxers and barefoot for three years. He had Jeremiah wear a slave's collar for 15 years. Poor Ezekiel had to lay on his left side for a year and a month and eat multigrain bread cooked over a dung fire. Listen to me, before you fancy yourself a prophet, ask if you have what it takes. In the New Testament, the prophet Agabus took Paul's belt and he tied Paul's hands and feet with it and he delivered a prophecy that Paul would be arrested in Jerusalem and turned over to the Romans. Before you fancy yourself an apostle, make sure you have what it takes. Along my journey, I've witnessed the Lord speaking in the church in prophetic acts. I had a pastor friend who uh, one Sunday after services, a woman in his church came up and she took my friend and his wife arm in arm and marched them up and down the center aisle, up and down, up and down, and she was weeping. And when she finished, she said, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, don't be afraid, I'm with you. The next day, the board of the church informed my friend that he had been let go. They had already made the decision, but they didn't notify him till Monday. But the Lord used a prophetic act to reassure my friend's hearts. And today they're pastoring a thriving church. The the cursing of the fig tree and the cleansing of the temple are, are not impulsive reactions on Jesus' part. They are prophetic acts. We have on Facebook, if you're on Facebook, we've created a group called The Last Days of Jesus. And every day we're adding some, Pastor Nick and I are adding some supplemental material. Everything Jesus did on Holy Monday was the fulfillment of scores of Old Testament prophecy and is way too much to unpack on one Sunday morning. But if you want to follow along on The Last Days of Jesus on Facebook, we'll be putting that out every day this week. But, but these are object lessons. They are acted out parables. They are announcements that God is taking his house back. It begins by each of us fully embracing Jesus' authority. Holy Monday reminds us that Jesus is Lord over his creation, including us. It hardly seems fair Jesus is walking to Jerusalem and he's hungry. 
He sees a fig all leafed out, but there's no fruit on it. So he curses it. That poor tree. It had an unfortunate encounter with Jehovah Zappo, as my friend Brian Simmons likes to say. We'll talk about the particulars in a moment, but, but there's something here to see. Jesus is hungry. One thing that shows us is that Jesus became a part of his own creation. Jesus was both 100% God and 100% man. But as Jesus moved through his life, and especially as he moved through the events of the Passion Week, his divine nature did not shield him from human suffering. The title Passion Week doesn't refer to God's love for us, although his love was certainly on full display. But Passion Week comes from the Latin passio, which means suffering. As Jesus moved through the most important week of his life, his divinity did not shield him in any way from suffering. Jesus suffered from hunger. He suffered from dehydration. He suffered from sleep deprivation. He suffered the physical effects of extreme stress. On Good Friday, he felt every blow from the Roman rods. He felt the hot spit on his face. He felt every lash of the whip. He felt every thorn piercing his brow. He felt the muscular exhaustion from carrying his cross up Calvary. He felt the excruciating nerve pain from nails that were strategically placed in his wrists and in his ankles. He felt the agony of not being able to exhale air out of his lungs while he was suspended on the cross. And Jesus suffered every human emotion as well. Rejection and grief and sorrow. He suffered from the hurt of being betrayed by one of his own and abandoned by all the rest. He suffered the hurt of being rejected by his own people. He came unto his own and his own received him not. In fact, rather than shielding him from suffering, the book of Hebrews says that Jesus' divinity actually intensified his suffering. He suffered the indignity of being weighed and deemed worthless by his own creations. Hebrews says, consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. The only thing worse than facing execution is facing execution with the knowledge that you're the most innocent man who ever lived. Indeed, the only innocent man. Jesus is hungry. He became part of his own creation, but it also reminds us that he is Lord over his creation. You see, based on the show of leaves, Jesus had an expectation from his creation. He expected fruit. You see, as creator, Jesus has expectations from everything in creation. He expects apples from apple trees. He expects bananas from banana trees. He expects birds to fly. He expects fish to swim. He expects cheetahs to run. He expects lions to hunt and dogs to bark. And he expects people to give him the glory that is due his name. Thank you for that golf clap. (laughs) Jesus had a right to expect figs from a fig tree, and he has a right to expect worship from you and me. He has a right to expect thankfulness. He has a right to expect submission and obedience. He has a right to expect service. He has a right to expect that we will not live self-centered, self-directed, self-satisfying lives, but we will produce for him. Jesus exercised authority over the wind and the waves, over gravity, over pigs, fish, and figs, and he exercises authority over us. Embrace it. Submit to his authority. Holy Monday also reminds us that Jesus is Lord over his own house. Matthew says Jesus went into the temple of God. Beloved, the house belongs to God. It doesn't belong to the chief priest. It doesn't belong to the elders. It doesn't belong to the congregation. It belongs to God. 
Beloved, can I tell you, this house, phase two, it belongs to God. It doesn't belong to Glenn Harvison. It doesn't belong to the deacons. It doesn't belong to the corporation of our congregation. It doesn't belong to the assemblies of God. It belongs to God. This is his house. He is in charge here. We'll talk about the particulars of cleansing the temple, but, but here's something to see. I, I never saw this before this week. It, it's pretty cool. When Jesus throws out the money changers and the animal sellers, he quotes from Isaiah and from Jeremiah. From Isaiah, he says, My house shall be called a house of prayer. From Jeremiah, he says, but you have turned it into a den of robbers or thieves. You know that that word robbers is actually the word insurrectionist. It's not a petty thief. It's a political rebel attempting a coup. When they arrested Jesus, they arrested him as an insurrectionist. In the garden, when they came, Jesus said to them, Am I the leader of a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? That word rebellion, it's insurrection. It's the same word Jesus used in the temple. You have made my house a house of thieves, insurrectionists. Barabbas was condemned to die for insurrection. John 18 verse 40 says he started a rebellion, the same word that Jesus used in the temple, but, but they traded Barabbas for Jesus, one insurrectionist for another. Jesus was crucified as an insurrectionist between two other, not thieves, between two other. Hello everyone, welcome to HT Church. We're so glad you join us for service today via live stream. Before we begin our service, we want to let you know about... Falsely condemned and executed as an insurrectionist when the real insurrectionists were hiding out in God's house. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a hideout for insurrectionists. Hiding out in God's own house were people who were living in rebellion to God. Calling the shots in God's own house were chief priests and elders who were living in disobedience to God. Hiding out in the beautiful buildings. Hiding out in the schedule of services. Hiding out amidst the ceremonies and the celebrations. Amidst the music and the readings and the prayers. Amidst the holy water and the incense and the candles. Hiding out beneath the robes were people whose hearts were clearly not surrendered to God. Can I tell you, 2,000 years later, it is still a problem in God's house. Let me say, even as a pastor, it's, it's easy to hide out among all the religious trappings of the church and yet be a spiritual insurrectionist. It's easy to hide out in the worship services. It's easy to hide out on one of the ministry teams or, or in a leadership position. It's easy to hide out in the prayer room. You might even be hiding out in the Good Friday choir. We're in church, but our hearts aren't surrendered to Jesus. Our lives, our thought life, our love life, our relationship, our attitudes, our, our stubborn wills, our prejudices. Our appetites, our, our habits, our entertainment, our finances, not surrendered to Jesus. Beloved, everybody look at me. Here is how we, the church, can fix what is broken in America. If we'll only stop hiding out in God's house and embrace Jesus' authority. Jesus is here to initiate a new day in God's house. Let's embrace him. Holy Monday. Three ways to initiate a new day in God's house. Number one, embrace Jesus' authority. Number two, embrace spiritual authenticity. Embrace authenticity. 
Both the fig tree and the temple had the same problem. The fig tree is a picture of the temple. They, they both had a flurry of activity, but no authentic productivity. They both had signs of life, but no authentic vitality. On the walk to Jerusalem, Jesus noticed this is one particular tree. It's fully leafed out. It was a little bit early. Nevertheless, the, the leaves should have been accompanied by early fruit, but Jesus found none. The issue with the tree is that its leaves advertised fruit, but it didn't deliver hashtag fake news. <laughs> and that was precisely the problem with the temple. When Jesus looked around at the temple on Palm Sunday, he found it bustling with activity. It was busy. It was too busy, but it wasn't productive. In the outermost court, the money changers set up their tables. Since Roman coins and all foreign coins had pictures of, of pagan gods on them, they couldn't be used to make offerings to the temple. Every male over 20, every Jewish male over 20 had to pay a temple tax every year, but they couldn't pay it using Roman coins or, or foreign coins. They had to use temple coins. So for everyone's convenience, coins could be exchanged in the outer court for ahem, a minimal fee. Originally, there were pens for sacrificial animals over on the Mount of Olives. But in Jesus' day, Caiaphas had those pens moved to the outer court of the temple and you could buy a, an animal to sacrifice for <clears throat> a modest fee. There was a lot of controversy when Caiaphas moved those pens to the outer court of the temple. So when Jesus cleansed the temple, it was a direct act of defiance against the authority of the high priest. In addition, people were using the temple courtyard as a shortcut across the city, which was forbidden. So when Jesus looked around, he, he was grieved by what he saw. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the commotion? Can you imagine the, the smell, the, the noise? It was busy, but there was no fruit. Beloved, can I tell you, after 25 years plus of pastoring, I, I find that we, the church, can fall all too easily into that same trap. There's a lot of activity around the church, but it's lacking in spiritual vitality. It's lacking in spirit-transformed lives. Jesus' actions and words on Holy Monday re reveal what kind of place God's house should be, what, what it's meant to be, everything it can be. God's house can be a place of warring worship and prevailing prayer. When Jesus says, my house shall be called a house of prayer, that word prayer, it's an umbrella word. It means everything that the worship of Yahweh incorporates. Singing praises to God, making offerings, lifting prayers, learning God's word, learning to listen to his voice. Yes, God does speak to Christians. Some children began praising Jesus in the temple, and Jesus says, yes, from the lips of children, you have ordained powerful praises. The, the quote is from Psalm 8, verse 2. It says there, through praise, you establish a stronghold against your enemies and you silence them. But I would listen, everybody, look, here's what's meant to happen in God's house. When we gather together to worship in here, God is fighting battles for us out there. When we worship in here, God defends us from our enemies out there. When we sing in here, God is silencing evil voices that have been raised against us out there. When the disciples see how quickly the fig tree withers at the word of Jesus, they're amazed. But Jesus says, don't be amazed. He said, if you believe and don't doubt, not only can you do what was done to this fig tree, but you can also say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea. Moving mountains was a metaphor that Jesus had already used in Matthew to say, you can do the impossible. 
I don't really believe that God means for us to use the power of prayer to go about cursing fig trees and rearranging geography, but he does want us to pray for and receive miracles. He does want us to use the power of prayer to take authority over spiritual strongholds and religious strongholds. He does want us to use the power of prayer to break the grip of spiritual insurrectionists so that the flow of life can begin in his house again. That's good preaching right there. What kind of place is God's house meant to be? God's house is meant to be a place of divine encounter with Jesus. Everybody look at me. Church is not meant to be a busy place for the sake of busyness. It's meant to be a holy meeting place. It's meant to be a place to focus on Jesus. To concentrate on him. To fill our minds with the truth about him from the word of God. To have our spirits filled up with his presence. It's meant to be a place to talk to him and and hear from him. Church is meant to be a place to make new discoveries about him. A place where he reveals his beautiful self to us. Earlier in Matthew, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, one greater than the temple is here. Jesus is the whole point of God's house. He is the purpose for God's house. He is the substance of God's house. Jesus doesn't exist to serve God's house. God's house exists to serve Jesus. What kind of place is God's house meant to be? It's meant to be a place where people receive supernatural ministry. When Jesus showed up in the temple, he started performing the kind of business that interests God. Prophecies were given and fulfilled. Healing miracles were performed. Spontaneous praises erupted. People were drawn to Jesus and became believers. And that's my prayer for the new harvest time per church. My prayer is that that we will be a place of warring worship and prevailing prayer. My prayer is, is that we will be a place where people have divine encounters with Jesus and where they receive supernatural ministry. In the midst of the heartbreaking testimony this week from the Parkland students and parents, I, I found the ray of hope. And that is the impact of a single life dedicated to God. A young shoe salesman was in an all-night prayer meeting, and in the course of the night, he heard a preacher say, the world has yet to see what God can do through the life of one man who is holy and fully consecrated to him. That, That word pierced that young shoe salesman's heart, and he responded in his heart, Lord, I want to be that man. His name was D.L. Moody, the greatest evangelist of the 19th century. This week we said farewell to the greatest evangelist of the 20th century, Billy Graham. My heart was so moved by by all the testimonies. So many of my friends that I never knew that, that their introduction to Christ was through the preaching ministry of Billy Graham. I was amazed at how even the press just uh, uh, had such sincere regard for him. I only ever heard him preach live once. It was in 1992 in Philadelphia, and, and I still remember the sermon. In fact, I borrowed freely from it a couple of years ago on Good Friday when I preached a sermon called Heart Problems. It was his sermon. I just made it mine. But it just goes to show what kind of impact that we as believers can make in the world if we embrace spiritual authenticity. Let's not be like the showy fig tree with no fruit or the busy temple with no spiritual vitality. Let's be authentically alive. Let's say, God, I want to be that man. I want to be that woman that is holy and fully consecrated to you. Holy Monday, three ways to initiate a new day in God's house. Embrace Jesus' authority. Embrace spiritual authenticity. And finally this, embrace a heart for accessibility. Embrace a heart for accessibility. 
Jesus' protest in the temple was not so much what the money changers were doing, but where. Actually, in the book of Deuteronomy, it is God who ordered that sacrificial animal be made available near the temple for purchase. Sacrificial animals had to be perfect. They had to be approved kosher by a priest. It would be impossible for pilgrims traveling great distances to bring animals with them and to, to not have that animal become blemished or injured in some way along the journey. And it would be impossible for the priest to inspect thousands and thousands of animals in just a matter of a day or two. And so it was God who ordered that animals be available and he ordered it to make worship accessible. You see, that's the heart of God. His heart is to welcome worshipers. Jesus said, he who comes to me, I will in no way turn away. So the temple was conducting business that it was actually commanded by God to conduct, but it was going about it in the wrong place. By moving this business to the outer court of the temple, they inadvertently blocked access to the Gentiles who could worship nowhere else. And this is what Jesus objected to. Looking at Holy Monday, there are three groups that Jesus gave access to. First of all, Jesus gave access to the next generation by affirming them. When a group of children see Jesus' miracles, they break out praising him as the son of David, the Messiah. And the Jewish leaders are indignant. They say, Jesus, tell them to be quiet. Jesus says, don't you know, God has ordained praise for himself from the up and coming generation. Beloved, everybody, please listen to me. One of our goals in phase two is to find a way to give access to the next generation. I came here 22 years ago. I was a lot younger than I am now. And some of y'all were a lot younger too. I'm determined that phase two is not going to be the great big building in Greenwich that nobody goes to. So I need you to work with me to give access to the next generation. Let's affirm them. Let's affirm that they're valuable to God. Let's affirm that they have a contribution to make. Let's affirm that they have something good to say. Listen to me. God has ordained praise to come to him from the millennials. God has ordained praise to come to him from those who are in high school now, from those who are in middle school, from those who are in elementary school, from those who are in nursery school, from the babies, from the toddlers. God has ordained that that generation should praise him with powerful praises. So let's work together to find a way to give them access. Three groups Jesus gave access to. Number one, the next generation. Number two, Jesus gave access to seekers by making room for them. John tells us that when the Greek visitors in the city heard what Jesus did, when they heard that he had pushed out the money changers, when he, they heard that Jesus had made room for them, they wanted to see him. As soon as Jesus made room for them, they came. We built phase two to make more room for seekers, but physical space alone isn't enough. We make room for seekers by being prepared to welcome them, by being prepared to receive them. We make room for seekers by being prepared to minister to their needs. We make room for seekers through Pathways Ministries. One of my favorite people in our church family is a woman who came here a few years ago to Pathways because she wanted to quit smoking. She didn't realize that she not only would quit smoking, but she was going to get lit up by Jesus. And she's still lit up today. We make room for seekers through men's ministries and women's ministries, through divorce care and grief share and single and parenting, through prayer ministries, through children's ministry, through youth ministry, through young adult ministry, through Alpha Course. Would you help us make room for seekers ready to receive them, ready to welcome them, ready to minister to their needs? 
three groups Jesus gave access to, the next generation, seekers, and finally, Jesus gave access to the unclean by healing them. One last thing that happened on Holy Mention that I, uh, Holy Monday that I have to mention to you. When the blind and the lame heard that Jesus was in the temple, they went to him in the temple. Now listen, the blind and the lame were not allowed in the temple. They were considered unclean. That's why in the book of Acts, the crippled man sat outside the gate called Beautiful. He wasn't allowed in because he was lame. But Jesus didn't drive the unclean people out. He healed them. And he gave them access into the inner courts of the temple. I want you to notice Jesus healed them first and then he gave them access to the inner courts of the temple. Beloved, there are people who because of their past or their present messes, they're unable to draw near. They're spiritually blind. They're spiritually paralyzed. They're living under guilt and shame and condemnation and the judgment of the church. But let's do what Jesus did. Let's give them access by healing them. Let's lead them to saving faith in Jesus. Let's lead them to the cleansing that comes by his blood and the indescribable transforming work that comes by his spirit. Let's lead them to deliverance, to to freedom through deliverance prayer, to wholeness by renewing their minds with the word of God. Just before we close, I want to throw something out that the Lord has put on my heart for our new sanctuary. When we set out to design this building in 1997, I wanted a sanctuary where people would want to come and pray any time of the night or the day. That's that's why we filled it with so much glass because we wanted it to be a beautiful, contemplative kind of place where, where people could just come and sit in the presence of God and pray. After Easter weekend, I'm trusting God's going to help us to be in the building every week after Easter weekend. And I want to start noonday prayer in the sanctuary every day, Monday through Friday. And I want to let the whole community know that our sanctuary is open for prayer every day at noon. I want to have some worship music playing. And I want to let people come and just sit in the presence of God and pray on their own. And I also want to have some people on hand to to pray for those that might want to be prayed over. It would require having volunteers every Monday through Friday at noontime, every week. It's a lot of people. But I believe if we make room for seekers, if we make room for the next generation, if we heal the unclean, I believe that will give them access into the presence of God. My house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. How did Jesus spend a holy Monday? He spent it investing in God's house. Let's do the same. Would you stand on your feet and give Jesus the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and